Well, it's a pretty awesome reminder and um, being made aware, maybe for the first time, of some of the ways that God's kingdom is coming to life uh, all over the world. And it's awesome that the Foundry Church had a chance to send a team and be involved in that. One of the things I love about my role uh, at Winning at Home is I'm around at different churches and I see that God's working all over the place. And it's so awesome to see the way that he's working here at the Foundry is not the same way that he's working at the church up the street, but he's doing what he's doing through all of us being faithful. And it's awesome to see these churches in Haiti that are reaching out to their community and are meeting the needs right where they are. Um, this morning, we're going to jump right into uh, the passage in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to stay in Ephesians like you've been for the past uh, few weeks or month, and we're going to take a look at just one verse this morning that's coming up on the screen. It's Ephesians 4 chapter 2, and Paul writes, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And these four lines that are up on the screen, um, that is packed with some heavy, practical stuff that we almost don't even need to talk about it, right? If you just read through that verse, you go, yep, I see where that would apply in my life and my relationships with the people that I spend time around and, and the ways that we miss each other, the ways that there's this tension. Uh, yeah, I get how this would plug into my life. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at that. And I'm going to share from my own life, um, mostly the ways that not doing this stuff uh, has caused some harm and some damage. And I'm going to be talking about this. I'm going to share stories about my wife and I. Annalise is here in the front row. I'm going to tell some stories about my immediate family. But the reason I'm telling those stories instead of the stories of my neighbors and coworkers and all this other stuff is because I have permission to tell the stories with Annalise and with my siblings and parents and stuff. But this relationship stuff, we know that throughout the course of a normal day, a normal week, we have hundreds of opportunities to put this into practice. And so we're going to go through and we're going to take a look at how that plays out in our daily life. So the first thing Paul writes here, be completely humble. When we think about what that looks like, usually we get a chance to practice um, humility, usually when something doesn't go right. Isn't that right? Like I, I've thought back to something that happened before I was actually on staff at Winning at Home. While I was in college, I was an intern there. And I worked for uh, my dad's assistant. So my boss was the boss of the whole thing. And I was filing some paperwork. We had this contract that had been signed by the other party, and it was at Winning at Home waiting to get signed. And I still can't picture exactly how this happened, but I, I was grabbing something off my desk, and I knocked over a cup of coffee right on top of this five-page contract that when I'm 18, this is like the most significant piece of paper that anyone had ever given to me, okay? And it is destroyed. Like it's five pages of coffee-soaked paper. Like nothing was going to save this. I tried to spread it out and dry it out and all that. And I was like, oh man, I realize I'm going to have to go and tell the person I'm working for that I just made a mistake that's going to make her look stupid to her boss. So I'm walking there, and how many of us have done this? We're kind of practicing what we're going to say. We've got our script, like, okay, how can I say this where it implies the least amount of responsibility my way, right? So I'm like, okay, you know, uh, coffee got spilled on this contract, right? That's what I decided I was going to say. And I'm walking into her, her office, and it's like, hey, coffee got spilled on, you know, it's a real passive thing. Like, no one's really at fault here. No one did anything. And I, I thought for a moment right before I walked in, like, no, I did this. Uh, I spilled coffee on this contract. So I walked in and I said, hey, I messed up. And in that moment, we have a chance to practice humility. We have a chance to be honest and realistic about 
what actually happened right there. Now, I wish I could say that that moment and kind of how things went from there just flipped the switch for me and like I never, you know, struggle in the moment, but something happened about two months ago. Uh, at the end of January, beginning of February, Winning at Home put together a marriage cruise. And so uh, my dad and I were both speaking on it. And, you know, it was tough to leave West Michigan in the middle of January and go speak on a cruise. But, hey, <laughs> got to do what you got to do. And so we're getting ready for this thing. And ahead of time, I had to go online and fill out uh, with Royal Caribbean all the, give them our credit card information if we wanted to order room service or anything like that fill out a whole bunch of the necessary paperwork. And so we're about three weeks out from the day we're leaving on this cruise. It's a Sunday night. I'm filling out the forms online, and it asked for our uh, passport information. So I went and got Annalise and I's passport, and I filled in her info, submitted that, went on, and then it was asking for mine. And I opened my passport, and I saw that it apparently had expired in July of 2016. Okay, yeah, and you know that just blood running cold moment, right? When you're like, oh, I screwed up bad here and I don't know. So, but first I was like, no, I don't think my passport's expired. I think I remember getting another one. So I'm, I'm going, I'm looking for it. I thought it was weird that they didn't hole punch my old one like they should have when I, when I got the new one. Of course, I didn't get the new one. So I'm sitting there like, oh my word, I've heard of people that went to Chicago and spent a whole bunch of money and you can get one overnight. So I sent a text to the guy that was organizing the cruise. And like I said, this is a Sunday night. He's a pastor at a church over by Lansing. And so he's obviously in the middle of something. But I send this text and I got the dreaded, if you've ever had this moment with a big thing you need like an immediate response on, it showed that he had read it, but he didn't answer. And so <laughs> I'm sitting there like, oh, no, this is a bigger problem than I'm even imagining. Like, he can't even just handle it right then in the moment. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm freaking out. Like, I'm a pretty just steady, take life as it comes kind of guy, but I was not in a good spot right now because I'm like, I got to speak on this cruise now that I can't even go on it. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, during all this internal freak out, Annalise had been in another room. She'd been back in our art room kind of working on some crafts and stuff. And she walked out in the living room, and she, as soon as she saw me, she could tell that I wasn't doing good. Something was wrong. And she's like, Alan, what's going on? What's wrong? And I said, well, apparently my passport's expired. And she looked at me, and she goes, oh, no, those are really hard to get. <laughs> And I had a moment right there. Um, I did not choose a humility-filled response. Uh, I went the sarcastic route. You know, I said, hey, uh, yeah, I already know that. Thank you. You know, because I was not in a place where I was ready to handle that the right way. And we all know we can probably picture in the last month or the last six months or whatever it is, this moment where something we did or failed to do caused some issues, and then instead of saying, oh, yep, that was me, that's my fault, uh, we took it out on the people around us. Now, I just want to, I don't know, I don't even know why I would need to tell you this, but you don't have to have a passport to go on a cruise. That's what, when the guy got in touch with me, he told me, birth certificate, that's all you need. So no one has to live through that hour and a half of panic <laughs> that I did if, if you're in that moment. So anyway, I don't know why I told you that, but I did. So anyway, all right. Be completely humble, and then he goes on, and gentle. And I want to talk about this one for a minute because this is not really something that we're taught to value in the world and society that we live in. Because we kind of think of it like this. We go, okay, in any business deal, in any negotiation, there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. And there's usually 
the person who decided to be nice and generous and kind, and then the person who wins the negotiation, right? And so we're kind of taught to think in this way of like, well, uh, I don't know that I really value gentleness because that sounds a lot like I'm going to get burned instead over and over and over. And I want to tell you a story that happened with me when I was, uh, I was 10 years old. My brother, he's three years younger than me. He was seven, all right? And we, I've told you before, my family, especially the, the boys in my family, we love the NBA. We love professional basketball. So we've collected basketball cards for basically as long as I can remember. We, would, we used to stop and pick up cans and bottles on the side of the road so we could take them to Meyer and return them and buy a pack of cards. And I'm guessing some of you in here remember opening little packs of baseball cards or football, hockey, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, something, I don't know. And you remember that these cards, uh, you can't see these great, but it's just cardboard with a picture of a person on it, okay? So this is what we normally get in these packs of cards that we open. Well, this particular day, when I was 10 years old, I got a rookie card, which if you don't know cards, that's what you're going for. I got a rookie card of Jason Kidd, and it looked like this, all right? You see the shininess? In 2018, this is not a big deal, but in 1995, this was like the height of technology, okay? So this was a beautiful card. And I got this card, and right away I'm like, oh my word, this is crazy. I put it right away in a protective sleeve, and I put it in my collection, and then I waited. Because especially back then, now if you, find, you get a card, you just go on eBay to find out what it's worth. But they used to have, and they still make it, but just no one uses it, a Beckett price guide that would come in the mail once a month, and you could look up and see what your card was worth. Now, I say that in quotes because if it says your card is worth $15, you can usually sell it on eBay for about three, okay? <laughs> but this came in really handy to convince my mom and then later on Annalise that all this money I'm spending on cards, look how much they're worth. This is beautiful. So right when cards come out, though, they're not listed. So you have to wait about a month. So I had this Jason Kidd card and nobody knew what it was worth. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, it looks kind of cool, but I, I bet you it's not as valuable as I'm thinking that it is. So I decided what I was going to do. I was uh, the older brother, and I thought, I bet you I could manipulate Josh, my younger brother, into giving me some of his really good cards for this Jason Kidd card. And so we shared a room, and I decided what I was going to do is whenever I knew he was going to be coming in the room, I would have my cards out, and I would be looking through them, and I would just say, oh, man, I'm so glad I got that Jason Kidd card. That is an amazing card. And I did that about three or four times, and then finally Josh spoke up one time. He's like, you are so lucky that you got that card. I wish that I had that Jason Kidd rookie card. I said, oh, Josh, you, you want that card? I'm, I'd be happy to trade it to you because, yeah, I want you to have it. It's really, really nice. But I said, I, I think it's probably going to be worth about $15, which I'm 10 and he's 7, okay? So that is a massive, I might as well have said $100. It's a huge number. And he's like, yeah, I think you're probably right. And so I went through and I picked out like three or four of his best cards. <laughs> and I traded him this Jason Kidd card for kind of the best cards he had in his collection. And then this price guide came in the mail uh, a little bit later on in that month. And he was all excited. He went and he looked up this Jason Kidd card and he found out it was worth $3. And he was so mad at me. He couldn't believe that I had burned him like that. But at the time, I had like kind of plausible deniability, right? Like, hey, no one knew what it was going to be worth. Eh, what are you going to do? But then I kind of doubled down on this, burning him on this deal, because, you know, Jason Kidd, he had a good career. And how cards are valued is based on how the player's playing on the court. So every time this price guide came in the mail, I'm like, Jason Kidd's doing pretty good. I bet you this card's going up in value. 
one month, this came in the mail, and the Jason Kidd card was listed for $4. And so I said, hey, Josh, without telling him the change in value, I said, hey, Josh, you know, I know that I burned you on that Jason Kidd card. Sorry about that. Uh, I do think it's a cool card. I'd, I'd love to get it back from you if I could. And he's like, well, it's worth $3, so give me a $3 card, and it's yours. I was like, $3? Okay, that sounds very fair. I'll pick out a card, and here we go. And we shook on the deal, right? That's what makes it official. So as soon as we shook on the deal, I said, hey, you might want to go look up that Jason Kidd card, see what it's worth. He looks it up, and it's listed for $4, and he cannot believe that I burned him a second time with the same card, the same guy that did it to him. So I, I came across this card about five years ago, which, by the way, this is worthless. If you sold it on eBay, I might get someone to pay me 99 cents. I would throw this card away if I wasn't going to tell you the story about this card. So I texted Josh a picture, and I said, hey, I, I came across this card. I think I'm going to share it when I speak at churches and talk about it a little bit. And he texted me back, and he said, you need to tell the people that you're speaking to that the story behind this card should disqualify you from speaking to anyone <laughs> ever. <laughs> and that was like 20 years after the fact. <laughs> I think he was joking, but, you know, I don't know. And we can think back, I'm guessing, all of us in here to moments like that where uh, gentleness didn't even factor into the way we were thinking about things, where we were looking out for our own advantage, our own priorities, our own whatever. And we decided, eh, if I have to steamroll some people along the way, what are you going to do? Sometimes that happens. And we know the weight of relationship damage and turmoil uh, that's sometimes been left behind us as we choose to focus in on us instead of loving and behaving to the people around us in a way that's filled with gentleness. Paul goes on. He says, be patient. And uh, Annalise and I have been having a chance to really practice this in life because over the past, I think probably about three months, uh, my speaking schedule has been really crazy. Annalise has started a new online class that she's uh, studying. We got a puppy, and we're in the process of, we've had an offer accepted on a house. We listed our house for sale this past Friday. So we got a lot going on right now. And I've been thinking about why we bought a puppy that his job is to like destroy our house. At the same time, we're trying to get the house ready to sell. But, you know, that's what we did. And we're getting a chance to practice what it looks like to be patient. And we started doing something um, last summer. We came back from a camp. We spent uh, some time. I was speaking at the camp morning and night, and Annalise was doing some craft stuff with the kids and then was also leading a small group for some of the moms that were there. And if you can remember being at a family camp or a youth camp or whatever, you remember how tiring those weeks are because it's go, 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 go. And then at the end of the night, you're staying up putting shaving cream on people's faces and toilet paper on their cabins and all that kind of stuff. And as the person who's speaking at that, you're not only go, 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 uh, you're also spending time talking with people who want to uh, work through some stuff that they're facing in life. And then once you get done with that, you're the person that they're putting shaving cream on and their toilet paper in your cabin. And so you're not getting a whole lot of sleep. And we spent this week at camp, and it was, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. And on the drive home, we realized we are shot. We are so tired. We are so burned out. Like, we just want to go lay down and sleep for, like, two days. That's what it feels like. And while we're in the midst of these first couple days getting back at home and readjusting to all that, 
we were kind of in that spot in life, and I'm guessing that a lot of you know what this feels like, where we hadn't had a conflict or an argument yet, but we knew, like you could feel that it's like, it's kind of miraculous that we haven't had a big issue because we're both just running on fumes and something is going to go bad here at any moment. And so what we started doing is we realized, okay, well, what's going to start that? We actually had a conversation about how do we avoid having this what feels like inevitable conflict. We said, well, what's going to start that most likely is going to be a miscommunication. It's going to be you interpreting something I say or me taking your tone and, say, and thinking you mean uh, you know, something that you don't really mean. And so we started this thing that even when I say it, it sounds crazy. It sounds ridiculous that this had any impact in our lives at all. But when we would say something that we thought maybe could be misinterpreted or maybe we didn't say it exactly the way we wanted to say it, we would get done and we would say, but I mean well. That's it. That's, it's like laughably simple. But we started doing this and just reminding each other that, hey, whatever way you're hearing that, whatever way you're taking that, whatever you think I'm attacking about your competency or your intelligence or your willingness to help out around the house, th that's not what I mean. I mean well. And we started saying that to each other. And we found, like I say, it's crazy. It had such an impact on the way that we would hear where each other was coming from that we kept doing it even after that week was over, even after we weren't so overtired and we just felt like this conflict was inevitable, we found that it made such a difference just to be reminded, oh, hey, w we are on the same team. And no matter how you're starting to hear what I'm saying or thinking through what this might mean for you or about you, I, I don't mean this in a negative way. I mean well. Now, I'm not suggesting that you show up at work tomorrow and you try that because people are going to look at you like you're crazy. But maybe if you try it in your home, maybe in your marriage with your kids, because you can talk about it and have a conversation and say, hey, this is just a little reminder that we're on the same team. But as you head into work or school or whatever tomorrow, you can kind of tack that on to what other people are saying and go, Okay, let me think and kind of see things a little bit from their perspective. Mo what might that mean for me to interpret it like they potentially have a valid point? We found it went a long way toward helping us to be patient with each other. And I really like these last two ideas here, this be patient, and it feeds right into the final one, uh, bearing with one another in love. Because both of those two things they really have built into the idea, into those phrases, that things aren't going exactly the way that I want things to go. And I think that's about the perfect description of what it means to be in relationship with other people. It means that there will be times, maybe a couple times, maybe a whole bunch of times, where things between me and others don't play out exactly the way that I want them to go. And when that happens, which is often, we get a chance to practice this, to bear with one another in love. And what this has looked like uh, for Annalise and I, as we've been married, it's coming up on almost four years now, we've figured out, it's taken us almost that whole time to identify this, but we've figured out that because of the families that we grew up in, we approach especially confrontation completely different ways. And so we've identified the seaborne way, we call it, which is the family I grew up in, the way that we deal with conflict. It, you've heard me speak here before at the Foundry. You've heard my dad speak. You know that we are comfortable with confrontation, you know, we're ready to jump into it, and I kind of say, you know, growing up when I would ask my dad for advice, 
it's sort of that thing where when you're holding the hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, he would just be like, confront, confront, confront. And I'm like, okay, but like, I feel like I'm going to alienate some of these. No, just deal with it. And I'm like, okay, so that's the Seaborn way. No matter what, hey, you say something I didn't like you to say, you do something I didn't like you to say, confront. I'm, I'm not going to be shy about it. I'm going to deal with it. And I can't tell you how many times, because the family that Annalise grew up in was so polar opposite. So the Seaborn way is confront. The Dykstra way, that's her maiden name, is peacemaking. And I can still remember the first time I showed up and met her family, the first time I met them, they were so excited to meet me. They're like, oh, and they're like hugging me. And I'm like, this is really weird. Like, you don't even know if you like me. Why, why do you like me? You know, I'm like, duh, I don't know what to do. And so whenever we're around the Dykstra side of the family, um, things are so peaceful. People go out of their way to be gracious and kind to each other. And one of the downsides that comes along with that is some of the things that maybe need to be confronted, uh, they're kind of skirted around. And so we find that when there's conflict in our relationship, we're coming at it from completely opposite ways. I'm ready to confront. I'm ready to deal with it. I'm ready to, hey, I'm going to be direct. I'm going to say exactly what I think. And the feedback I've gotten from people and from her is that I come across like a jerk in that moment. Because I'm not trying to say it in a way that makes you feel good. I'm trying to say it in a way that makes you get what I'm thinking. And she's coming at it from this other perspective. And she's trying to make peace. And so she's so subtle and so indirect sometimes that trying to get at barely saying what I want to say, but not quite, so I don't want to offend you, that I'm sitting there going, why is she lying? Like she's massaging what happens so much. I'm like, why can't she just tell the truth? And so we're sitting here bringing into our relationship together these two opposing viewpoints of how to handle conflict and confrontation and how to deal with this stuff in the moment. And we've gotten a chance to figure out what it looks like to bear with one another in love. Because in these moments of conflict and confrontation, I'm comfortable there. And I'm ready to talk about how I felt about what happened, how I would have felt about what happened if it had been just a little bit different, what I wish would have happened instead. And I'm, I'm ready to go. Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Annalise wants to talk about, okay, what went wrong? How do we avoid it in the future? Let's go back, sorry, let's go back to peace. And so we figure out what this looks like in our lives together to bear with one another in love. And it looks like seeing things from each other's perspective way more than we naturally would. And when we stop for a second and go, okay, if she stops and goes, okay, yeah, he's interpreting this conflict and confrontation with the seaborn lens that we got to just hammer it and fix this thing and I'm interpreting it from the Dykstra lens, that I'm trying to, to get back to reconciliation, to peace, to figuring out how we move forward from this as quickly as possible. And we've found um, that that takes a whole lot of work to bear with each other in those moments. And what I want to encourage you to do is whether it's your spouse, whether it's your kids, your co-workers, neighbors, whoever it is. Take that extra moment to look at things from their point of view and say, okay, if they weren't completely crazy about how they're reacting to this, what might be true? What might be the need that they're trying to communicate at the core of what they're getting across? That's one of the ways that we can bear with each other in love. And when we leave this place today, we're going to get a chance to practice this stuff often, often throughout the rest of this afternoon, this evening, heading into the week. There are going to be a whole bunch of times 
where we get a chance to live out what it looks like to be completely humble and gentle, to be patient, and to bear with one another in love. And what we find all throughout Scripture is that God is calling us to these really difficult but really practical and really life-changing ideas. Because if we lived our relationships totally this way for just a week, we would see so much change. So much change. And I really believe that God wants to work in our lives to bring us closer and closer to this. So I want to invite you to pray with me for a moment. God, we, uh, we thank you that when we read scripture, that we're challenged and we're confronted and we're reminded that the way that we naturally want to react or behave or the things we want to say or the way we want to think, um, God, those aren't always ways that are going to create harmony that are going to lead to healthy relationships. But God, you offer and invite us into a better way. And we thank you so much for that. God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will be at work in our lives, strengthening us, making us more and more like you so that we leave this place, God, and we look like people who are humble and gentle and patient and who bear with one another in love. Not so people can say, wow, they're, they're so great, they're so kind, they're so all these things. God, but so that people can see the way that you have been at work in our lives. And so not we, but you receive the glory and honor. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go today, let's go and keep praising his great name with the way that we live, with the way that we love one another, with the way we're in right relationship with each other. As we do that, more and more people see his glory and praise his great name. Let's go do that. You're dismissed.